Okay, so today we want to take a look at parametric equations. We've done the hard work, we did all the series stuff, and we've rewritten transcendental functions as infinitely long polynomials, and we know where they converge and all that business. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. Parametric and polar are very sort of closely related in the sense that polar, you can look at polar as parameterizing by theta an angle going round, but we'll talk about polar later. Let's start with parametric equations. A parameter or parametric equations are equations that are written in terms of a parameter, okay? So parameter is just a dummy variable. It's a variable that we choose and then we rewrite our other variables in terms of that dummy variable in terms of the parameter okay so the parameter the parameter is a chosen variable it can be anything it can be anything typically it's t That's because time is usually the independent variable, right? And everything else, movement in space, x and y, z, that all takes place parameterized by time, right? On your calculator, uh, here's your calculator, you'll notice that your independent variable here is x, t, theta, n. So it's built in. Those, are, those correspond to the different modes in your calculator. So if you go to mode, You'll notice it's right here. Usually we're in function mode, but there's also parametric, polar, and sequential. So we can switch this over to parametric. If I go down, go over to parametric, it's blinking and hit enter. Now I've switched it over. Now when I go to my y equal, you can clear that stuff out. You'll notice that it's giving me x and y, and these are functions of t. So if I enter and I hit the, my independent variable here, boom, it's automatically t. It's the common parameter. Okay, and very often what we can do is put bounds on that. So we'll put some restrictions on the parameter. No, we don't have to. We can just let it run any way we want, but very often that's kind of a nice key because if I say something like, you know, zero is less than or equal to, t is less than or equal to four, something like this, then my parameter, when it runs, it's gonna start at zero and go to four. So this automatically has a built-in direction, okay? And that's kind of the main advantage of parametric equations is that when we're looking at equations on the uh, Cartesian coordinate plane, they're just like there, right? They're just all there at once. When you look at a, a, par a parabola, right? The whole thing is just there, it's static. By picking a parameter and putting bounds on it and running X and Y in accordance with that parameter, we can actually put things in motion. So this is very useful if we're talking about you know, particles or objects, things moving in space and things like that. We can actually give it a direction. And not only that, we can parameterize in any way we want to. It's, it's arbitrary, it's, we choose it. Now there may or may not be uh, a reason to parameterize in a specific way, depending on what situation you're looking at. I mean. You know, you may just want to parameterize along with time, and time runs just normal, right? But maybe I want to make something go twice as fast or go backward in time. This is very easy, right? If I want to uh, make something go twice as fast, well, I'll just double my parameter. If I want it to go backward, I'll just make it negative t, and we go. Okay, so that's, that's completely arbitrary choice. So let me show you what I mean. Let's say we have like uh, y equal 2x squared plus 3x, okay? 
just a normal rectangular equation, parabola, it opens upward. Okay? Now, we can parameterize in any way we want to. So I can come up, let's come up with like two or three different ways to parameterize this thing. If I say, well, x is t. So in other words, I'm saying the independent variable is time, is t, whatever. Okay, well then y is, I, all I have to do is evaluate x equals t. It's just straight 2t squared plus 3t. Here I have my parameterized set of equations for that parabola. And now I can restrict t if I want to, or I could just let it run from negative infinity to infinity or whatever. But maybe I'll say something like, oh, negative 2 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so in that case, x is just running along with t. So if I want to look at the where it starts, I go negative 2. Okay, t is negative 2, which means x is negative 2, because x is t. And so I've got y equal to, let's see, that would be negative 2 squared is 4, 8, minus 6 is 2. So negative 2, 2 corresponds to the, the xy starting position at that t equals negative 2. And then at t equal 1, again, x is just t, so it's going to run right along with the time. And then we just have what... Um, Two plus three, five. Okay, so one five, which corresponds to the ending point, right? So we have this parabola. It opens upward more or less. We are at negative two two to start, so somewhere like over in here, and then we end up at one five. So it's starting here. It's going doo -doo -doo -doo, this direction. Doo -doo -doo -doo, and then ending at 1, 5, slightly lower there, like that. I maybe should have blown that up a little bit, but you get the, the idea that it's got to start, it's got to stop, and it's got to speed in the sense that X is just running with time. So let's say I wanted to make it go four times as fast. Well, all I need to do is choose my parameter differently. I'll just say, okay... Now x is 4 t. x is 4 times time, which means then that y will be, uh, let's see, 4 squared, 16, 32 t squared plus 12 t. Yeah. And there we have a completely different parameterization of this same parabola. Now, when t time runs, say, from 0 to 4, it's going to end up at 16, right? We're going to evaluate this thing at 16, or this thing, at x equals 16, rather than just x equals 4. So it's going to be moving 4 times as quickly. If I want time to run backward, well, x equals negative t. Now time will run backward. It's still, oh, no, it's not going to quite be the same. Let's see, it'll be uh, negative t squared, so it'll still be um, a 2t squared, still positive. And uh, that would be a minus 3t. Right. So there we got three different parameterizations of this parabola. We just choose that parameter and we can dictate its direction and its speed, which is very nice. Like I say, if we're talking about particles or objects moving in space, things like that. Um, we can now put our generally static functions in motion. All right. 
So we've seen how to take a rectangular function, a normal equation, just like that we're used to, x and y, and parameterize it, turn it into a set of parametric equations. We just pick that parameter and then write each of our variables, x and y, in terms of that parameter. To go the other way is simply a matter of solving a system, eliminating a variable, or eliminating the parameter. Okay, so let's say I started, here, let me give myself a little more space. Let's say I started with some parametric equation like x equal 4t plus 1, y equal 3t squared minus 2. Okay. And maybe there's some restriction on t, but we don't really need to worry. Let's say I have this parametric equation. I can either solve the y equation for t and plug into x, in which case I'll have x in terms of y, or, which is kind of weird, I can solve the x equation for t, plug that into y, and I'll get y back as a function of x. So we're eliminating that parameter by solving one or the other. We're solving a system, right? solving one or the other equation for the variable, and then just substituting in, solved by substitution. So I'd have what, um, t is x minus one, divide four, which means y is three times x minus one, or four squared minus two. And then of course, we'll just distribute this out, combine like terms, we're just doing algebra at that point. Here we have a function y in terms of x already. You can see that it's a parabola that opens upward and that sort of stuff, right? Cool. All right, so that's going back and forth between the two. If we have a rectangular equation, we can parameterize it basically any way we want to. If we have a, a set of parametric equations, going back to the rectangular is a matter of eliminating the variable. Now, sometimes, it can be a little trickier than that, and we might have to rely on something that we know. Say, for example, uh, I want to, or I have the parametric equations, something like x equal uh, 5 cosine t and y equal 5 sine t. And let's run t between 0 and 2 pi. Now, as you start to work with these a little more, you start to build a little bit of an intuition of what some of these things do. Now, if you have some weird parameterization like I had in the last, like, 3t three, three minus 1, that's hard to picture in your head what's actually going on. I mean, we can describe it, but imagining moving at triple speed and then minusing 1, that's, that's a little difficult. But when we're thinking about these, um, there's an easy way to sort of build an intuition, really. Like, just ask yourself, okay, 0 t is running between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, fine. So what's happening to x? Well, what does the cosine do? The cosine goes from 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1, back and forth, back and forth. But that's multiplied by 5, right? That's the amplitude. So it's going to go 5, negative 5, 5, negative 5, like that. That's the x value. Simultaneously, right, t is running independently. So at the same time, the y is going to do sine. Well, that's going to be from 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, but starting at 0, right? But then we've got 5, so that's going to multiply the amplitude. So it's going to go from 0 to 5 to 0 to negative 5. And those two things are going to happen at the same time. So the x is going back and forth between 5 and negative 5. The y is going back and forth between 5 and negative 5. This is a circle. Yeah? If these were different, they're different radii, you could just picture like if we had 3 cosine t and 10 sine t, well, the x value is going to go back and forth between th 3 and negative 3, 
the y value is going to go back and forth between 10 and negative 10. That's an ellipse. Okay? So by just sort of looking at these and thinking about the behaviors of those things, uh, are the variables separately, we can sort of get an idea of what's actually happening. So this should be a circle, and you say, well, how am I going to get it from one to the other? I mean, we can do the arc cosine or something like that, but then we're going to be evaluating the sine of the arc uh, cosine. We can do that, but there's a simpler way if we think about our trig. Because look at, look at these. By definition, these are coming out, right? X is R cosine theta, and Y is R sine theta. This is coming straight from the definition of the cosine and the sine. Cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Just divide, right? The sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. But we know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, or cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. Pythagorean identity, yeah? But we know what the cosine is and what the sine is. So it's x over 5 squared, that's the cosine squared, plus, we got the sine, y over 5 squared, equal to 1, and there we can see this is x squared over 25 plus y squared over 25 equal to 1, and we multiply our 25 over x squared plus y squared equals 25. And we can see, sure enough, this is a circle centered at 0, 0 with radius equal to 5. So that's one of the trickier ones when it's not just straight, easy algebra. I mean, we can, like I said, go through evaluating the sine of the cosine and draw our triangles and figure that all out. But it's a heck of a lot easier to just use our Pythagorean identity this way. Nice. And like, like I said, the same thing would happen, the same issue, like if, if we took that example of the fourth, three cosine t, and what did I have, y equal 10, sine t, we're going to get this same structure where we have x over 3 squared plus y over 10 squared equal 1, x squared over 9 plus y squared over 100 equal 1. And this is the equation of an ellipse, yeah? We can see that it's taller in the y, the semi-major is on the y, and the semi-minor is on the x, yeah? And we can see what those are. Nice. So by just changing the amplitudes, of course, we're changing the shape of that, right? If they're equal, it's a circle. If we make one smaller than the other, then we're going to be an oval. Awesome. Okay, so that is parameterization and going back and forth between... Let's see, the derivative, the derivative of a parametric equation, it's relatively straightforward. We're just playing around with differentials. In fact, it's just the chain rule. dy dx is dy dt divided by dx dt. Right? I mean, if you just multiply by the reciprocal, that's dy dt times d -d dt dx. This is chain rule, right? That's why I'm saying it's just chain rule playing around with differentials. Now, the neat old thing is we're given y in terms of t, right? It's a parametric equation. So y is a function of t, 
and x is also a function of t. So taking their derivatives with respect to t is perfectly natural. The only added thing is that we need to do the two derivatives and then divide them. Okay, that's it. So let's say uh, we have x squared, uh, no, sorry, x equal t squared minus 4t and y equal to 2t cubed minus 6t. And we're going to bound our t between negative 2 and 10. And let's say, let's find the equation of the tangent line at t equal 3, say. So find the equation of the tangent at t equal 3. In order to find the equation of a line, all I need is the slope and one point on the line, right? So finding the slope, is a, that means taking the derivative. So I want to find out what is dy dx. Well, that means I need to take the derivative of y with respect to t, but y is a function of t. So taking this derivative is perfectly natural. 6t squared minus 6. There's dy dt, the derivative of y with respect to t. Divide dx dt. And again, x is a function of t, so this is perfectly natural. 2t minus 4. There we go. Now we have an equation for dy dx. Now I want to find, that's the slope, right? I want to find that at t equal 3, which means I just need to evaluate this. So let's see, 6 times 9, 3 squared, minus 6 over 2, 6 minus 4. Uh, 54 minus 6. So 48 over 2 is 24. I think I did that right. Let me calculator for thing. 50, uh, 9 times 6, 54, minus 6, divided by 2, 24, sure enough. Nice, okay. So we've got our slope then. We found out what the derivative is. Now let's find out a point on this line. Well, we have t equal three. If t is equal to three, x is nine minus 12, which is negative three. And y is three cubed, 27 times two, 27 times two, minus 27 times 3 cubed, 27 times 2, minus, what would it be, 6 times 3 is 18, 36. Nice. And now we're just doing just regular algebra, finding the equation of a line, right? We have m, it's 24 at, at t equal 3, and we have x and y at t equal 3, so it's just y equal mx plus b, and, and we'll be good. So y, 36, is equal to m is 24, x is negative 3 plus b, uh, 24 times 3, 72, So we're adding 72, 72 plus 36, 
108. He is 108. Nice. So now we have M, we have B, we're done. Y is M is 24, X plus B is 108. And there we have the equation of the tangent line at T equal 3. So it's not really very difficult to find those derivatives. You just take the derivatives of x and y with respect to t and then divide them. That's it. Now, there is a slight weirdness to the higher order derivatives. And you would think that here we're getting, oh, I already erased it. Um, we got the first derivative as a function of t. So you think, okay, if I want to take the derivative, all I have to do is take the derivative with respect to t. Well, that's true, but you can't forget, we need to divide by dx dt again, okay? So d square y dx squared, and it's going to be the same notion for all higher order derivatives as well. This is going to be the derivative with respect to t of dy dx of our first derivative. But you can't forget, we still need to divide by dx dt again. Right, and, and second derivative, that gives us our concavity, right? If second derivative is positive, it's concave upward. Second derivative is negative, concave downward. Zero could, is a possible inflection. Okay, that's the only weirdness, though, as far as taking derivatives go, is you just have to remember you've got to divide again by dx dt. So let's look at, uh, well, let's take the same one we were just looking at and find the second derivative. So we have what? x is t squared minus 4t. Uh, y is 2t cubed minus 6t. Whoops. OK, and now we want to find the second derivative. Find d squared y dx squared. Or just to, the same, I could ask you to find the concavity, right? And give you a particular t. Cool. Okay, so first thing we've got to do is take our first derivative. We've got to find out what is the y dx. Well, we just did that. We took the derivative of y, which is 6t minus 6, over the derivative of x, 2t minus 4. Sixty squared. dy dt 60 squared minus 6. Double check myself. 2t minus 4. Looks good. Okay. So there's our first derivative. Now, in order to get the second derivative, we're going to take the derivative of the first derivative. Uh, that's quotient rule, but still. We're going to take the derivative of the first derivative, but then we need to remember to divide again by dx dt, but we already have dx dt. It's here. So we're working on uh, d square y dx square. So we need to take the derivative with respect to t of our dy dx, which is 6t squared minus 6 over 2t minus 4. But then we can't forget, I still need to divide by dx dt, but we have dx dt. 2t minus 4. I don't want to do that quotient rule. <laughs> I'm just being lazy. Okay, um, let's see. We have... The derivative of the first, 12t, 
times the second, 2t minus 4 minus the first, 6t squared minus the 6 times the derivative of the second, just a 2, all over the second squared, 2t minus 4 squared. This is the derivative of this quotient, and then that's going to be divided by 2t minus 4. I suppose this is kind of nice. I can just pull that up and make that a cubic. Um, I suppose there is some like terms and things that I can combine, but we're just doing algebra at this point. All the calculus is done. Well, let's see, what do we got? Um, 24t squared minus 48 t minus 12 t square plus 12 over 2 t minus 4 cube 12 t square minus 48 t plus 12 over That is the second derivative. Okay. And again, the kicker on that, or the thing that we need to remember when we're doing the higher order derivatives, is I have to do that derivative of my previous derivative with respect to t, which is here, but then divide by dx dt into u. The same thing would happen, right? For the third derivative, I'm going to take the derivative of this but then I need to divide by dx dt yet again. Okay. Cool. So that's first and second derivatives, higher order derivatives. Um, how do we find the area? Rather than going through the proper derivation, I'm going to give you a very ugly, hand-wavy one, okay? But it's the same diff. So we have these two functions, right? y is a function of t and x is a function of t. And I want to integrate this y dx. That's really what I'm trying to find, the integral of y dx, right? That's the idea. So I'm looking for the integral of a to b of y dx. And I go, oh, but wait. a and b, they're not x's. Okay? So they're going to be some parameter like t t1 and t2, say. So really what I've got is t1 to t2. And this y... It's a parametric equation, so it's actually a function of t. dx. And I go, oh man, I am all disagreeing, right? My bounds are t's, y is a function of t, but I'm trying to do this all dx. I really want to do this dt, right? That's my independent variable. So how can I do that? I go, well, let's... Multiply by one, <laughs> right? That's it. That's literally it. Integral from t1 to t2, y of t, x prime of t, dt. That's the area. That's how we integrate. I don't, I wouldn't say that's really a proper derivation. I mean, it's not the proper algebra, but 
a little hand wavy, but it works. It's the truth. Okay, so it's very formulaic. It's just a matter of taking the derivative of x with respect to t, but it is a function of t, so that's easy, taking the integral of their product. Now, that may or may not be easy depending on what our functions are. You know, products can suck, but otherwise it's just a matter of plug into this formula and then deal with whatever the resulting function is that you have to integrate. So let's say, um, let's find the area, find the area, we've got x equal to 3t squared, y equal to 4t cubed plus 1, and let's say the interval 0 is less than t is less than t. So it looks like our x is traveling, it's accelerating, it's getting faster, right? t squared. And then y is already a cubic, so it's getting faster on a cubic. It's going shooting off like a rocket ship. All right, and our idea was, or our goal is to integrate this guy, find the area underneath. So. All I need to do is take my bounds. Okay, there's my t bounds, 0 to 3. Cool. Got y as a function of t. 4t cubed plus 1 times. I need to take the derivative of x with respect to t. But it is a function of t, so that derivative is no problem. 6t. That's the derivative of x. dt. 0 to 3, where we got 24t to the 4th, plus 6t, dt, and our resulting product was not bad, it just devolved to power rules, so we've got 24t to the 5th over 5, plus 3t squared. Right, so the t squared over 2, and then 6 over 2 is just 3. Bar at 3 and 0. Everything has a t in. So the second one zeroes out. All I need to do is evaluate at 3. So 24 times 3 to the 5th over 5 plus, so that'd be 3 cubed, so 27. And then whatever that comes out, I'm being lazy, but unit squared, right? It's a definite integral, so it's the area unit squared. Of course, I should simplify that, but eh, let's calculate that. Okay, so that's how we find the area underneath, or how we integrate. We just have to take y of t times the derivative of x, and then dt, integrate like normal. Cool. Arc length, the arc length in parametric is actually even nicer, I, I think. I think it's beautiful because it's, it's so symmetric and nice. It's still, the arc length is still the integral ds. Uh, arc length. It's still the integral from t1 to t2 ds. But now when we ch define our ds, if you remember when we did it before, we were looking at the Pythagorean theorem dx. So what we did was we multiplied by 1 dx squared over dx squared and then pulled that square root of dx squared out so that we got our link between ds and dx. Well in this case we're not looking dx you know, it's before, that first one just was dx over dx squared, so it was just a 1. It kind of looked lopsided and weird. We got the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. And you're like, yeah, okay, but weird. 
This time, we're doing the same exact thing. We're multiplying by one, but now we're doing it all dt, d t, yeah, with respect to t. So our dx dt, that doesn't collapse to one. It's dx dt squared. So we get this beautiful, symmetric, nice looking equation. The integral from t1, t2, ds is, well, we take dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. Oh, same idea, same everything as before. Except now, instead of collapsing to 1 here, since we pulled out this dx squared over dx squared, which became 1, and then pulled the dx out, this time we did it with respect to t. So that dx dt is still chilling there. And again, those x and y are functions of t. So these are just straightforward derivatives. We plug and chug, take their square. Now, we have seen before that doing the resulting integrals of these can be hairy. We may have to resort to trigonometric substitutions or other algebraic hoops, completing the square to try to get rid of that square. So we've dealt with that when we did uh, arc length and surface area before. The only change now is that it's not a one, it's a dx dt. Okay. So let's try one. Let's find the arc length. Find the arc length and let's say we've got ooh, x equal 3 cosine t and y is equal to 3 cosine t. 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to pi. Ah, this is a circle centered at zero with a radius of three, right? It's going to go x, three, negative three, negative three, positive three, back and forth. Y, it's going to do the same exact thing. They're doing those simultaneously. Well, it's a circle. Nice. So we're actually just finding the arc length from zero to two pi, or zero to pi, excuse me, of, uh, of a circle. We could do that in rectangular, but we know that's not pretty, right? We've got to deal with the square roots and all that. So let's just go with it this way. Say, okay, uh, it's the integral from 0 to pi. I've got my t's, 0 to pi. Now I need the square root dt. I need dx dt squared and dy dt squared. So dx dt, derivative of the cosine is negative sine, so it's negative 3 sine t. It's the derivative of x with respect to t. Oops, sorry, this should be a sign. Sorry. And let's see the derivative of y with respect to t. The derivative of the sine function is cosine. We have 3 cosine t. All right. So that's it as far as, you know, setting up the calculus or the difference with parametric to what we've done before. We just needed the dx dt in here. Now we got to end up dealing with whatever the resulting function is. So let's see. We have 0 to pi square root. This is 9 sine square t plus 9 cosine square t dt. I can pull a 9 out. Integral from 0 to pi. Uh, square root of 9 is 3. I can pull that all the way outside. And I have the square root of sine square t plus cosine square t 
dt. But the sine square root of t plus the cosine square root of t is just 1. So I have three integral from 0 to pi dt. Right, because this is just 1. Square root of 1 is just 1. Nice. So that's easy enough. It's 3t bar to pi 0. Second one zeroes out, so it's 3 pi. Units, just units, right? This is an arc length. Units. Excellent. Okay, so we found the derivative and the second derivative of a parametric. We've seen how to integrate, find the area underneath. We've seen how to take the arc length, it's actually very nice. And the surface area is identical, right? It's the same deal. 2 pi r ds, it's the same as before, right? Except now our ds has this pretty bound. So if I'm taking a parametric curve and rotating it, rotating it around an axis, yeah, like we did before, and I want to find out what its surface area is, surface area, it's 2 pi integral t1, it's t1, t2, of r is a function of t. Now I'm going to write it r of t rather than picking one because it'll matter. If we go around the x-axis this way, then my radius is y as a function of t, right? If we're rotating this way, the radius is there. If we're rotating around the y-axis this way, then my radius is the x, x of t. So it'll depend on which axis you go around, but in either case, what we're concerned about is the radius of that figure, r as a function of t. And then ds, right? But our ds is nice and symmetric. So this is gonna be uh, dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. All right, everything about it is identical to what we did before. The only change is this is not a one anymore. It's now symmetric. It's dx dt. So let's try one. Let's find the surface area of, let me put the problem somewhere else here. Let's say x is t squared, y is mm, 2t, 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 4. Uh, we're going to rotate this guy about the x-axis. Good deal. Okay, so I'm just setting up my formula. Since I'm going around the, the x-axis, the radius of that is in the y direction. So I'm going to take the radius as a function of t, that's y of t in this case. So I've got 2 pi integral, my bounds are 0 to 4. The radius, since I've gone around the x-axis, is y. Square root dt, and now I need dx dt squared, dy dt squared. So let's see, dx dt, 2t.
dy dt just 2. Very nice. Okay, so now we're just doing algebra basically. That was the setup. That's the calculus. Well, we still haven't done the actual antiderivative, so we haven't done the integration, but um, now we're trying to deal with this structure, right? So let's see, I can pull this two outside. Four pi integral zero to four t root, this is gonna be four t squared plus four dt. Um, I suppose I can make my life a little bit easier. I could just sub right now. I could just do a u sub and it wouldn't matter. Um, but I suppose I can pull that 4 outside of here, right? I've got a common factor of 4 and that's a perfect square. So I can take that square root of 4 out. It'll be a 2, which will make that an 8. one dt so i've just factored out the common factor of four then took the square root of four which was two and then pulled that two outside sweet now that's about as simple as i can get it in terms of the algebra i'm going okay i'm still stuck with a product here but this looks like it's going to be an easy peasy u sub if i u sub for what's under there u equal t squared plus one Nice, du is 2t dt. The 2 doesn't bother me. I've got the t dt sitting right there. Beautiful. So that radius was bothering me before, but I'm very glad that it's sitting there now because that's going to let me do this use of. So this half is going to come outside, so that'll become a 4 again. The t dt, that's the u. We have u to the one half power, so this looks like it's going to gener degenerate just to a power rule there. But since I'm doing a u sub, I do have to change my bounds. Those bounds are t's, so I need to figure out. Let's see, if, if t is 0, u is 1. If t is 4, 16 plus 1 u is 17. Now I can just do my antiderivative and evaluate with the bar. I've changed my bounds, so everything's all in terms of the u. I'm good to go. So let's see, I've got 4 pi, 2 thirds, u to the 3 halves, power rule, add 1, barred at 17 and 1. So that is 8 pi over 3, u to the 3 halves barred at 17, 1. I think I'm just going to leave it. Oh, well, I, yeah. Um, well, we have 8 pi over 3. This is 17 to the 3 halves minus 8 pi over 3, 1 to the 3 halves. I think I'm just going to leave it, like, just factor it, right? So we've got 8 pi times, this would be 17, root 17, square root of 17 cubed, to simplify, minus 1 over 3. And then, of course, we can find out whatever decimal approximation that is just by typing in the calculator. This is the surface area, so this is a unit squared. And that's it. Not the prettiest answer, but, I mean, what do you expect? We know there's going to be pies and weird stuff happening, so it's not going to be a nice decimal necessarily, but still.
doable. No problem. It's very, very similar to what we did before with arc length and surface area. The only change, like I said, is that we got to do the DXDT. Nice. That is parametric equations and calculus, really. We've looked at parametric equations, what they are. Just pick your var uh, variable and write your other variables in terms of that dummy variable, your parameter. We can dictate that any way we want to. To go backward, we're solving by elimination. We're, so you know, solve one or the other equation for your parameter and then plug into the other vari uh, other equation to eliminate. So we've seen how to go back and forth from rectangular to parametric and vice versa. Um, we then saw how to take the, oh, we graphed one, we plugged in some t's and calculate x and y. Um, we found the tangent line, so we took the derivatives. We found the curvature, the second derivative. Again, the tricky thing is, is that we got to take the derivative with respect to t of our derivative, but don't forget to divide by dx dt again. And the same for all the higher order derivatives. So how to do the area? Just integrate the function y times the derivative of x. And we saw how to do surface area and arc length, just the same as usual. Same as our other formulas, it's just that they're very nice and symmetric. We've got dx dt squared and dy dt squared. Awesome. That's parametric.